Welcome everyone to our first webinar this summer. Um, I am Natalie Steinfeld Childre, the Publications Manager at the Center for Open Educational Resources and Language Learning, which is located at the University of Texas at Austin. Hello, and I'm Garen Fons, Project Manager of CORAL. Uh, thank you all for joining us for the first of three sessions in our CORAL Summer Webinar Series. Today we're going to be talking a bit about finding open media for foreign language instruction. But before we do, let's go over some basic information for this session. So uh, many of you have likely used the uh, Adobe Connect interface before, but if not, we encourage you to make this session interactive. On the left, as many of you already have found out, um, we have a chat room slash questions uh, pod, for lack of a better word. Uh, you can ask questions here, uh, and we will do our best during the presentation to answer uh, the questions that you have, but please uh, send them along. Uh, and let's maybe have some of the technical issues that we're having around uh, addressed maybe after the session, or perhaps send us an email at, um, at our CORAL website. We'll figure that out. We can't necessarily understand why the links aren't working for you all. So, uh, but we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, if you're going to be tweeting today, please use the hashtag CORAL. Um, and if you're interested in downloading the presentation slides and some of the other resources that we have available that relate to today's presentation, there's a file share uh, and a, the ability to download those resources right below the presentation. Um, we're also going to be posting this presentation. It'll be recorded uh, online on our website, and uh, all these slides will be available on SlideShare. Um, if you have any technical issues or sound issues today, there is um, a technical help button in the top right of your screen. There is an FAQ of some of the most common technical issues using Adobe Connect there. Sometimes it may help also to try another uh, browser such as Chrome or Firefox, which seem to be working best with Adobe Connect. If your technical problems persist, you don't have to worry about missing important key points. We will be recording today's presentation and making it available for later viewing on the website, on our website. Um, if you get kicked out for some reason, please log in under the same name as before so we can keep track of who's here. All right, so finally, uh, many of you who are joining us today have, again, already indicated your desire to receive the CME and CPE credit. Again, we're going to figure that out and take care of it. but. If you uh, want to try the links in the info uh, tab, go for it and try and register. Um, but we'll, we'll be getting to figure that out and get you all a certificate of attendance. Okay, so Darren, today we're going to talk about the process of finding and searching for authentic open media for language learning and teaching. We want to start off by talking about a wave of changes that's taking place in education and discuss how open educational resources are a part of this reform. Uh, we do intend uh, with this session to encourage those of you interested in open educational resources to keep on working to create, share, and promote these resources. And those on the other side inspire those of you who are new to the area to explore it. We, well, we'll be. Uh, spending a bit of time defining OER, but we're also going to talk a bit about copyright today, and uh, especially alternative copyright licensing arrangements made possible by Creative Commons. And then we will also be trying to talk about where to search for resources and also review a few OER-specific repositories and other online sites excellent for language teachers and learners. Some of them can be implemented directly into the classroom. Others enable you to just use pieces you need. And yet, the other uh, ones that we will mention invite you to build something completely new. All right, well, thanks, Natalie. I'm going to start talking about reforming education. It's an ambitious topic, but I want to start here by saying that at all levels, education is beginning to reimagine itself, and without a doubt, we exist as part of a new, digitally rich landscape in which new forms of scholarship, educational pathways, and connection to resources, people, and communities develop each and every day. But what is most clear is that 
as these new connections, communities, and forms of scholarship develop, an older model of how students are supposed to learn, how teachers are supposed to teach, and how administrators are supposed to manage is quickly beginning to erode. Many people would call these disruptive innovations, and they're doing just that. They're disrupting the status quo. They're challenging traditional conceptions of what we are all supposed to do as learners and as teachers, even as parents of learners. Um, the access to resources, these new educational pathways and connections to information and individuals have opened doors to new possibilities and new methods, many of which we cannot even keep up with. And I know it can be intimidating, but there's no arguing that this is truly an exciting time to be a part of education. Um, Garen, it seems that there is a lot of audio issues going on. Yeah. Um, can we see maybe some hands raised from the people that do not have, do not get any audio or have some issues? Yeah, some folks may need to um, enable their audio. <laughs> it's, it's one of those stuff. Do you want to? The other thing, too, is that, again, we're going to be uh, recording the presentation. So for those of you who don't get it uh, right now or just haven't yet enabled the audio, um, you might need to do that. Um, it should be available later so that we can, uh, you can listen to it there. So, And again, again, some of these audio issues can sometimes be the connections that people have. Uh, we've optimized it for DSL. So uh, if you're on a modem, it's going to be hard. Um, anything better than that is definitely going to be uh, all right. So, all right. All I right. Guess we can continue. All right. So, um, back to this then. Saying one of the one of the most striking things um, I think to come as a result of these disruptions, however, is the fact that educators and learners have uh, begun to dismantle the construction that learning is a linear pathway. Uh, that uh, if students simply conform to the rules and standards that have been constructed, that they'll be set right. Uh, the fact is, is that these disruptive innovations uh, made possible by technology, the access to resources, social media, and improvements in content sharing are helping more people understand that learning and education is not about being some race toward a finish line or to college or just some job. That education is actually about creating the conditions in which the students, the teachers, and all those involved in the experience of learning have the capacity to flourish. So some of these ideas are largely put forth by uh, a gentleman named Sir Ken Robbins, and who argues that life is not linear, right? It's organic, and that we create our lives symbiotically as we explore our talents in relation to the circumstances they create for us. And more importantly, he argues that when we look at reforming education and transforming it, it isn't like cloning a system. It's about customizing to your circumstances and personalizing education to the people you're already teaching. And in doing that is the answer to the future, because it's not about scaling a new solution. It's about creating a movement in education in which people develop their own solutions, but with external support based on personalized curriculum. And this is what we really want all of you to begin thinking about today, which is to say thinking about the fact that we all have the opportunity to reform education and be part of this community of cultivating learning. It's our belief here at Coral that OER are an integral part of this movement in education. We believe it so much it's in the name of our center, right? It's our argument that open educational resources are a part of this wave of change in education and that they have a real place in both helping to personalize education and bring the values of organic growth into our teachers and students educational experiences. So while not exactly new, open educational resources have undergone a radical change since their popular debut in the early part of the 2000s as MIT open courseware, right? So openly licensed educational materials have become a unique way for learners of all types to access material, to peek into classrooms, but they've also become invaluable resources for teachers and students. OER have become magnificent resources for teachers to not only supplement traditional or mandated teaching aids, but also resources that serve as a point of innovation for many teachers. The licensing that comes with these OER 
enables teachers to repurpose and recontextualize materials for their own use, not only minimizing the work that they may have to do in order to build something from scratch, but also gives them a way to build on the works of others, improve these resources, contextualizing them, uh, and contextualizing, contextualizing those resources and then sharing them. It's also our argument that OER, in large part, are the building blocks of this free and open culture, and that together, these resources form grow, a growing corpus of high quality, universal, free, personalized digital material available to teachers like you, administrators like you, and, and learners like you. There are materials created and built by people who value education, value sharing, and who share the goals of being able to contextualize and repurpose these materials to apply to their contexts. And so we're excited to talk today about finding these open educational resources and are just incredibly excited that you're all here interested in learning more about it. So with that, are there any questions so far? We wanted to mention that we have um, about 60 participants um, chiming in, which is excellent. Um, we would like to hear from, from you and you, in general if you have any questions regarding the content of this uh, presentation. All right. So uh, before you talk about finding OER, can you spend a few minutes talking about what open educational resources are and touch on why copyright plays such a big role in all of this? Yeah, all right. So among the first true definitions of an open educational resource comes from the 2002 UNESCO Forum on the Impact of Open Courseware for Higher Education Institutions in Developing Countries. It was a report that was created in 2002 at that meeting. And this group met to discuss the implications of MIT's Open Courseware Initiative. And in the report that they generated from that meeting, they described an open educational resource as a universal education resource available for the whole of humanity. Now, I want you to hold on to that definition because we're going to come back to it in a little bit. But it's a great definition, as it, I think, makes clear the aim of the OER movement as a whole, which is to bring resources to the public for free, without restriction, and for the benefit of the public, right? So, of course, there are other definitions, whether they're ones drawn up by Wikipedia or from some foundations that support the ongoing development of OER, like the Hewlett Foundation and the Shuttleworth Foundation. Um, there are also definitions like this one that come from Dr. David Wiley, one of the pioneers of open educational resources, he, who describes them as uh, uh, teaching and learning and research resources that reside in the public domain or have been released under a copyright license that permits their free and our free use and repurposing by others. So um, as we try and define what open educational resources are, there's obviously many types. Uh, we've got uh, full courses that are available through programs like MIT OpenCourseWare and other open courseware initiatives, which include then course materials like syllabi, uh, there's modules that are created uh, for specific learning exercises in mathematics and, and sound, or excuse me, and in science. Uh, there's full textbooks available. Um, there's streaming videos even, of course, made available on a lot of the open courseware sites and other uh, open uh, initiative sites as well. There are tests, there's journal articles, uh, and a whole slew of other tools or materials used to support learning. I know that Dr. Wiley, like many others in the field of OER, truly stressed the importance of differentiating between free and open. Can you talk more about this? Yeah, so this is, this is important, I think, for all of us to understand, is that free and open are not really one and the same, right? So even though people will sometimes use them interchangeably, uh, people make frequent reference to resources and software that are free. Uh, and even conflate open access with this concept of open, but that's not necessarily what we mean when we use that word. When we talk about OER being open and free, we're not just talking about free access or free as in no charge, like this image of free stuff on the side of the, of the, of the road, right? Um, well, no cost and no cost to access are components of what we mean. What we're mainly stressing is the concept of freedom. Right, in the concept of freedom to reuse, 
to revise, to remix, to and redistribute the material. This is also kind of known as the four R's. And one of the important things to note here is that uh, that there are a vast number of online resources that can be accessed for free uh, and used in the educational context. I mean, think about every web search that we do or news article that we read on the web. A majority of these resources are free, and that's one of the most important things about the internet, but few of the resources that we uh, come across are actually open. Uh, in other words, open and free to legally download, share, remix, reuse, and revise, right? So that's what this, de this graph demonstrates in large part. Uh, this is from David Wiley, um, who sort of tries to put this in play by saying that about 99% of the content on uh, you know, the internet is free to access, but if you really want to actually make use of that content, you build upon it, change it, contextualize it, and share it with others, you run into some potentially major challenges with copyright. Okay, but before we unpack copyright, I think it might be helpful for me and other if you could explain what it, it meant by reuse, revision, remixing, and redistribution. Yeah, all right. So I sort of mentioned this as the four R's earlier, and, and uh, you'll hear this maybe quite a bit, or you'll see a lot of in the context of Creative Commons and, and whatnot. Uh, and the basic concepts behind that is that materials that are OER or openly licensed are generally, uh, depending on the license, giving you the possibility to reuse it. In other words, you have the ability or the right to reuse that content in its unaltered or verbatim form, like backing up a copy uh, of the content onto your hard drive. Uh, you could revise that content, right? You can adapt it or adjust it, modify it, or even alter it if you wanted to, like translating it into another language if you wanted to, or uh, you know, adding some other component to make it fit your context. Uh, the other R in this context is remix, right? Giving you the ability to combine the original or, or revised content uh, with other content to create something new. So you could incorporate this content into a mashup, let's say, or, or a variety of other uh, videos, let's say, or if you're making your own video, you can put it in there. And of course, the other R in this is the ability for you to redistribute that, meaning you have the right to share the copies of the original content, your revisions, or your remixes with others. So giving a copy to a colleague or a friend or, or someone else, whether that be in person or online. So explain how copyright works in relation to the 4R concept. All right, so copyright uh, provides the content creator and the individual who holds the copyright with the exclusive right to control how people can utilize their work. Uh, they retain what is called all rights reserved. Um, and that's not bad, right? It's that copyright gives the copyright holder the opportunity to protect against uses that they don't consent to. Uh, it's a brilliant part of our legal system, and I think in large part it's an essential part of encouraging innovation, right? Um, but, or to, to just to add on to that, I guess it's what that means is that a person who has copyright uh, has the ability to limit the four R's that we just talked about, right? The copyright holder then has the exclusive right to make copies of the creative work. Uh, they have the exclusive right to, to control how it's distributed or shared and, and how and who can sell that work. Uh, they limit who can perform or display that work in public. They even limit who then can make derivative works, including adaptations and supplemental materials. Uh, they control who can make, in, in large part, and distribute those derivative works. And most importantly, they license uh, who has the ability to do that as well, right? So copyright in large part is a big deal, right? Anything that's created by someone, you know, whether it be art or writings or music, movies, it could be you know, a number of different things generally, and I, for your copyright nerds out there, you all understand what I'm saying, but generally would have copyright. Um, and then in most cases, that creator of this work would obtain a copyright to that work which means then that that copyright automatically, or that copyright holder automatically has the all rights reserved copyright on that work, controlling who can copy it, distribute it, and modify it. Um, and going back to the point as we talked earlier is that most of the content on the web is actually all rights reserved. So one of the things though that I want to mention here in this is that I, I want us to ask ourselves what the purpose of copyright actually is. And 
it says it right in the Constitution, of, of all places, that the purpose of copyright, and this may go contrary to what you expect it to be, is to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for a limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So basically what this says is that copyright is meant to promote intellectual and technological progress for the benefit of society, right? And so remember that UNESCO definition that we talked about earlier, a universal resource available for the whole of humanity? Well, in large part, these definitions are similar. Uh, which is quite unique in, in thinking through the purpose of, of, of a lot of, or the intention at least, behind a lot of these, the desires here to share resources. Copyright law in large part then is about the balance between the author's need to make money and society's need for greater progress. But for progress to happen, people need to be able to share knowledge and create works based on other works. Uh, and this is where, in large part, the notion of limited time comes into play. Uh, but the limited time is anything but that. Right now, because of uh, extensions in copyright law, we're looking at uh, the life of the author plus 70 years before somebody can technically utilize an all rights reserved work, and before that copyrighted material falls into the public domain. Uh, and who knows, it very well may get extended. So uh, originally it was 14 years with one renewal maximum before it entered the public domain. Um, but in large part, you can see sort of the complexity of this, which is if we don't have any sort of alternatives, uh, we very well limit our content, our ability to access content and build upon that, which limits, limits the ability for society to progress. So let's say I want others to use and modify the work I create. What if I want others to make use of the photo I took, or a lesson plan I have written, or a presentation I have made? How can I let others know that this is the way I intended this to be used. Yeah, so anyone who creates something can let others know how they would like to share the resource by using what's called a Creative Commons license. And many of you might know about this, others you may not. Um, but openly licensing content is actually really easy. Um, it basically it takes this concept of all rights reserved and moves it to the notion of some rights reserved. Right? Um, you don't abandon your copyright by using a Creative Commons license. You basically just extend it. Um, you, you remember that last part of, of, of copyright talking about one of the rights that we have is, is limiting the ability for, to, or allowing us to license the content to others? Well, that's basically what co Creative Commons helps one do. Is it gives you the ability to license that material to others. Um, Creative Commons licenses enable the copyright holder to extend the privileges of copyright to others uh, at a minimum by allowing or having people attribute the work back to the, to the author. And you can place other restrictions on uh, the content that you create or the content that you would be uh, trying to use, um, and that, uh, such as that it may not be used for commercial purposes or that I can't change it um, or that if I include it in another work that that work also must carry a Creative Commons license. Um, but most importantly is that these licenses truly give the user a clear understanding that they can copy and distribute work without having to ask for permission from the copyright holder. It gives them an understanding that they can legally download and publish the material in a stable location so you don't have to rely just on linking. And in some cases it gives you the ability to adapt and customize the materials for yourself or for your learners, right? So, Garen, is anything with a CC license on it an OER? Yeah, I mean, you could basically say that uh, anything that has a license on it is uh, open, and um, also what you can say is that anything that's in the public domain, uh, works that would fall out of copyright have been and created by the government or have been dedicated in the public domain are, um, are basically free as OER. I should back up and maybe explain this slide here. Uh, that basically Creative Commons licenses and the benefit of these licenses, again, as we were talking about, just basically allow those users to, to know exactly that, that we talked about that. So. But I still don't quite understand why is open so important, especially when I can get pretty much all I want to use off the internet for free, regardless of whether it is copyrighted or not. 
Why should we be looking for items with Creative Commons licenses on them? Yeah, so this, this in some ways is the question, right? It's been asked since the age of the, or the dawn of the internet, right? Um, it's, you can find pretty much anything on the internet, so why put in the effort to find and search for open content if you can just open up a search engine and find images and videos and songs and other resources totally for free, right? And so why worry about finding open content when teachers and educators are protected under fair use to make use of copyrighted content for educational purposes, at least here in the United States? Um, I think what we're trying to talk about today and promote and, and, and hopefully encourage in a lot of you is that, is that opening up a web browser and finding free content is an old model, right? It's an old and unproductive habit to simply use anything. We certainly understand that it's easy, but it's also something of a dead-end approach in the process of learning and as a part of the goal of reforming education. What we're, what we're trying to encourage is for teachers to, uh, and administrators, support staff and students uh, to reframe the way that they think about teaching, managing, and supporting education. Do we have a question? Um, yes, we do have a question. Good. Um, Aileen uh, asks us why our core resources are under a Creative Commons license that allows commercial use. Okay. Um, and if we could explain this option All and right. why we choose this option. So, it's un so the question is, coral resources are under license allowing for commercial use. Um, so First of all, not all of our products are under commercial um, usable license. They're all different and we're making sure that we ask our project directors what they want to do what they want the end user to, to be able to do with their resources. Um, and that gives them the freedom to, to feel better about what they're putting out there. Yeah, sometimes some folks feel that uh, by putting on a, uh, some of these other restrictions on the, on, the, on the material, such as having a share-alike license or a no derivatives, or even in this case a non-commercial, is too much of a limitation and that they want to see that material go as far as possible. And by having uh, simply someone at, attribute the author, it, and that's, that's good enough. Uh, I know of a lot of folks who actually also dedicate material just straight into the public domain. Um, and a lot of the images that you'll see in this presentation are, are, are just that, images that have just been cast out there for everybody to use and, and remix or repurpose. Um, and so I don't think that we're necessarily going after the, the goal of making money on, on these resources and, and it's possible some of the things that we do with print-on-demand resources we, we, can, we can recoup, but at the same time the goal is again for people to get them into their hands and reuse them as best as they possibly can. So the, the end goal I think also is to have a, as wide of an exposure as you can get because um, pretty much everything today is driven by popularity um, also, and, and opening it up to commercial use gives you new platforms of distribution. That's true. That's a really good point to say on that. Um, and, and somebody had asked here who the, who the pres presenter is. I'm Darren Fonz. I, I said that earlier on in the, in the presentation, but some of you who just joined us you should probably interrupt and do a station <laughs> break or something. <laughs> Yes. So, um, and this is Natalie Steinfeld. I'm children. Natalie Steinfeld Children. I'm the publications manager at Coral. Um, there was also a question about iTunes U lessons. Oh, okay. So uh, iTunes U, some lessons are licensed, others are not, right? So this, this gets to the reality of some of these materials being open access, as in free to access, but if you want to, let's say, download them or reuse them, uh, broadcast them, you might be limited by some of the same licensing that would, would occur when you're downloading a song. Um, you know, you can't remix that song necessarily or rebroadcast it. Um, so you, you really have to look closely at how some of the, the resources that are published in places um, uh, are really licensed. And we'll get to some of that here as we talk more about in the next half uh, about finding and, and sharing some of these resources as well. So. So getting back to this sort of uh, 
talk about why we should even begin using uh, open educational resources or search for them and, and whatnot is, is, again, trying to really encourage people to sort of change their mindset about what education is truly about, right? And so we want people to begin thinking about uh, larger questions, right? What if edu instruction uh, were contextualized in real events of the world and professional discourse, right? What if learners were asked to do their work in the open web where peers and mentors and practitioners could encourage learners and where learners could develop digital identities? Um, questions like, what if learners were encouraged to connect their learning with content being produced by practitioners in their area of study? You know, what if we encouraged a more organic approach to education where instead of simply trying to make students learn, we're more focused on finding ways to create the conditions for growth and improvement? Um, you know, these are the sort of questions that we're, we're really focused on and we feel that OER is a part of creating this sort of environment. So, Okay, so say we're all on board with uh, open educational resources. We understand the benefits and now we're eager to find them. Where do we go? All right, so this is the title of the presentation. The, all the other stuff in large part was uh, getting or leading up to this. But we're going to talk in general now about um, you know, finding open educational resources by using uh, web tools. Um, one of the best places, I think, for folks to go, and we've mentioned it now just in talking about the licenses, is to creativecommons.org. Uh, they have a great search engine built into their website um, where you can search across uh, a variety of different uh, uh, both databases and, and websites for open content. Now, it's, it's, I, I hesitate to call it a, a search engine. I think they, they're doing something very different technologically, but um, is a great place for you to, to know that you're actually conducting the search right. And from there, you can begin branching out into some of these other areas. Um, I see a question here from uh, Adriana, which is, if neither symbols are present, is it safe to assume it's open? So this is, <laughs> this is a good question. Uh, it's, it's actually, I would say, it's probably not safe to assume it's open. open. Um, by default, someone who creates something that has copyright or excuse me, by, somebody, by default, somebody who creates something automatically receives a copyright. You don't have to put a, a copyrighted symbol on it. You don't have to register your copyright with someone. Uh, so uh, if it's a creative work, uh, it's, it's likely under copyright. So um, if you see a symbol with a Creative Commons license on it, um, then yes, it's going to be open. If you see it with uh, a resource created by the United States government or it's you know, a, a work that appears incredibly old, uh, you know, let's say prior, prior to uh, the 1900s, you're most likely going to be fine to use that resource. But uh, the default assumption, unfortunately, is that, yeah, unfortunately the resource is probably not available, which in large part, or excuse me, is not open. So which leads a lot of people to simply using stuff without really knowing. So. Um, there's another question about, um, you mentioned digital identity. Um, I don't know if I talked so much about a digital identity, but I think what I'm getting at in this is that there are uh, digital innovations that are happening, uh, or that, that are basically a part of, 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 of how we're learning and how we're uh, interacting with one another. I mean, perhaps when we talk about digital identities with learners, is that it's that technology no longer is a uh, is something that's incredibly special, right? It's it's ubiquitous. It's in our pockets. It's, it's in our backpacks. It's at home. It's among our friends. It's it's something that's pretty much everywhere. So we we by default have a digital identity. Uh, and again, we're talking about this in the context of the many places in the U.S. Uh, not all uh, environments are, of course, as privileged. Um, but for for students, a lot of students, you know, even in places that are less privileged. You know, access to technology is, is, is there, and again, it's not just about technology, but in some ways it's about access to other uh, connections that are made possible by those technologies. Um, but as a result of that, with technology not being as special, I would imagine that people are focused more on the, what it means to learn. Look, we don't need these tools like, to be enamored by the tools. We need to be enamored by the connection and by the, by the, by the learning that happens as a result of that. So, um, or, or Aline, if you have got a more specific question about that, I'd love to, love to hear it. So, 
so what if you what about if you convert something from one source to another, like in the case of a YouTube video or a WMV file? Um, again, you're going to have to look at the licenses. YouTube, by default, has a standard YouTube license, which gives the individual who uploads the content to YouTube their their copyright. Uh, if you convert that file, uh, it's, it's, this is one of those gray areas of copyright. Um, you you very well may need to ask for permission because the the the, the reality there is that you're going to be potentially sharing it. But if it's for personal use, I think you're probably going to be all right. If it's going to be in the context of the classroom, you're probably going to be all right under fair use. Uh, but you have to really ask your question: of Why am I why am I changing this format? Um, you know, what, what, for what purpose is, is, is it intended? If it's intended to share with others, then, then uh, you might be in a position of, of, uh, of infringing someone's copyright. So. But if it's under a Creative Commons by license, they are free to do Absolutely. whatever they want. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, if it's under a non-derivative license, or uh, you know, then, then you, you, you may not very well be able to do that. Mm -hmm. so. And so it's fair to the end user, um, and, and we actually, when if, Every one of you um, in the future um, puts a license on the materials you create. Um, that will just be a better way to communicate to people who are using your resources what they can do. Yeah, that's great. All right, so with the 20 minutes remaining, we're going to keep going through looking at places to find OER in general, and we're going to really get uh, on to talking about uh, language learning specific resources. I, can, I, I love the copyright questions and I think we're going to have to do an entirely new session on it um, and it'll be, we very know well. Um, so the next thing I want to show you after Creative Commons uh, and please go there and check it out is obviously most of us are doing Google searches to find uh, resources when we're putting together lesson plans or, or, or uh, trying to find content that's exciting. Uh, what I would suggest is that people check out if they haven't underneath uh, your 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 basically your control panel of of, of the Google browser. Uh, look at the uh, the settings page here and, and go to the advanced search. And if you've never done this before, you can go to usage rights, which appears in the in the bottom of the page, and you can filter the results that you receive uh, by license type, right? Giving you uh, materials that that would fit your context, whether it's uh, ones that you want with just attribution or ones that uh, you feel you would perhaps uh, put into a different resource that you might uh, monetize in some way. So check out that for sure. Uh, another place that you can turn to to just find general content, uh, we're talking about photos and videos and sounds, uh, some of which are, again, great for language learning, sometimes just having realia or authentic media, is uh, at Wikimedia Commons. There are um, just a, a great number of resources here, and it's expanding. It's basically the back end for uh, Wiki, Wikipedia. So um, if you've never been there before, uh, definitely check that out. So. OK, so how much open, how much openly licensed con content? Yeah, well, I, I'm just not sure. There's a lot of open content available. But how much? So how much? <laughs> All right. So I get kind of happy when I see these numbers, right? There, if you look right now, there are close to four million licensed, openly licensed videos on YouTube. Nearly 17 million free media files, uh, free and open, I should say, on uh, on the Wikimedia Commons. More than 240 million openly licensed Flickr photos. Uh, and 42,000 public domain books in Project Gutenberg. This is just scratching the surface in large part of, of what's out there. And basically that's to say that like so many people are sharing resources, whether it's institutions, individuals, governments. Um, every year the amount of content that people um, are making available and how is available to create new material is, is staggering. Um, you know, this is like having millions of new building blocks at our disposal. You know, these individual pieces that we're talking about, like photos and songs. Uh, there are other assembled resources like learning modules and presentations. Um, all of these materials are evolving, right? As we see that, as, as we look at Wikipedia articles or remixed videos or, or even just seeing how people have uh, employed content in, in, 
in varieties of contexts and then and then share them again. So, but uh, uh, sorry to hear that YouTube and Wikipedia are are blocked. Is it, uh, uh, Taryn? You you described that. Um, I don't know if that's a school policy or if that's something that's uh, specific to country, um, but uh, that's that's difficult to hear. Um, so as we're talking about the number of OER that are available, obviously we can talk about uh, types. We're, we've sort of highlighted some search engines or a, a, a variety of areas you can go to find what we would largely call these building blocks, these images, these songs, these videos. Um, but there, as you look at types of OER, there's obviously a great evolution into full-fledged uh, uh, sort of comprehensive materials, right? Open textbooks. Uh, in this case, we've showcased some of the textbooks made available by the Connections group in, um, in Houston. Uh, open courseware, right? We've got PowerPoints and audio and lectures and lecture notes and syllabi. There's classroom activities and, and lesson plans that are available through that. We even you know, have a lot of resources for uh, teaching language learning um, available here at the Coral uh, office, and we'll talk more about that in a second. I mean, it just, it just is amazing how many different types of, of, of resources are out there, especially folks who are looking to learn a second language uh, as well. So what about open educational resources specific to language learning? Okay, so this is where this gets kind of exciting, is that as we talk about communities of, 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 that, are, that are stemming around the creation of OER, um, there are an immense number of materials available uh, specifically for language learners and teachers that, that really focus on this idea of, of adequately or even exceptionally learning a language. Uh, again, all these materials are, are geared for reuse uh, and, and not just in the classroom, but a lot of times outside of the classroom. And so one of the, a couple of the resources that we want to highlight, one is a, a database or a repository called Merlot. And um, this has a large collection of materials, probably one of the larger uh, collections of OER materials. This, it spans a variety of disciplines. Um, but inside of uh, language learning, um, this resource is, is pretty amazing. You've got the ability to sort of search by language. Um, uh, you can uh, find a variety of different kinds of materials that are both, uh, you know, image-based or even module-based. Um, you will also find that this resource is amazing because it in large part employs this sort of curation principle. Uh, there's an ability for people to review different resources, giving ratings to ones which they've found to be appropriate for their context or just, just great resources in general, which means that these resources in large part are rising to the top. Um, so we invite you to check that resource out. Another repository type uh, is, is, is called OER Commons. Um, this is, again, one of the, one of the one of the large repositories of, uh, of OER content. Uh, it's specifically focused on OER. As, as I didn't mention in the last, but Merlot is not necessarily all OER. Um, but this uh, resource, OER Commons, is. Um, the language collection here is small, but uh, because it's one of the uh, sort of most well-known repositories, that collection grows. Um, unfortunately, you can't uh, browse by language. But uh, again, this uh, initiative is sort of uh, pretty amazing. It's been around for a long while, and it's uh, constantly evolving, making new tools uh, that, uh, that enable people to uh, contribute and remix materials quite easily. Uh, this is just another sort of look at that. Uh, you can, again, browse by language, the, the sort of different age groups, different uh, context areas, things like that. And they also have a lot of great resources for uh, just people to learn more about what OER are and how to implement them and, you know, teacher training and what, whatnot. So um, another great resource uh, for those of you who teach or are interested in learning about less commonly taught languages or LICTLs uh, is a resource that's been made available by uh, the University of California in Los Angeles or UCLA. Uh, it's called the Language Materials Project. Um, and this is a, again, this is a fantastic resource. There's not a ton of material in here, but again, this is a growing community uh, practice, and, and as more people know about it, hopefully more people contribute. Um, one other resource I want to highlight uh, is Wikiversity. It's similar to that of the Wikimedia Commons, a similar sort of structure and finding things. Uh, again, really kind of good at finding um, 
uh, more specific content toward uh, these sort of, as we talked about, images or uh, small little uh, activities for you to use in the classroom. Um, but why I kind of want to highlight it is that it's also kind of a really interesting growing community uh, of, of individuals who contribute uh, and, and draw from it. Um, one of the cool resources from uh, Over the Pond in, in, in the UK is uh, an initiative called the Language Box. Uh, I haven't had a lot of time to play with it, but uh, the Language Box is in large part blending this idea of both finding content, but also a place for folks, uh, teachers and learners and whomever it might be to store, manage and publish content. Uh, and then allowing you to, the tools to basically publish those um, those materials on the web and then share those ma uh, materials that you create uh, with others. So I uh, definitely encourage people to take a look at that resource. Um, and this, again, it's probably uh, growing as, 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 as individuals in Europe probably contribute to that, uh, not just in the US. So another one from across the pond is a place called Joram, and I apologize for the screenshot there. I've got uh, it's covered up, but um, similar to that of, of, of the sort of language box, but this one is more of a repository of content and, and focuses on, on uh, providing folks with um, tools and resources to learn more about implementing OER. So uh, these are some of the others that we're not going to have time to talk about today, but I encourage you to sort of take note of this slide, download the presentation, and grab, grab some of these images and then visit these sites. Uh, the Orange Grove is out of... Uh, Florida, it's context, you know, content that's largely created by and, and pulled from Florida teachers. Um, you've got La Mill, which is, again, a, a sort of interesting way to find content. Curriki, Joram, OpenStax College for textbooks, connections for textbooks, and then SlideShare. I mean, this is a community that has persisted for five, to, oh, I don't even know how long, but oh, quite a long time. I didn't, didn't imagine it would be around this long, but uh, thousands and thousands, millions of resources available there. Uh, again, some of them are not open, but uh, many of them are, and again, you'll find our presentation on here and, and others who, who link to these uh, sort of resources uh, that way. So, all right, so uh, another place to find OER is obviously uh, in the context of the language resource centers. Uh, there are obviously more language resource centers than these 15 that are displayed here, but these are the 15 that are federally funded. Um, by the Department of Education. And inside of that, um, we have a variety of different ways for you to search across what resources that these language resource centers have. Um, they're focused on free resources. Uh, CORAL is one of the few language resource centers that is specifically focused on OER, but uh, this is a place where others are getting into the field and you'll probably see a lot more open content in there. So check it out. Uh, at uh, the Language Resource Centers, or the National Foreign Language Resource Centers. Um, I'm going to stop and maybe brag a little. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but uh, if you are interested in resources, you probably already know a lot about some of the ones that we create. Uh, we have a variety of amazing textbooks, work, basically workbooks that go along with courses. Uh, we've got materials that uh, help folks in a variety of different languages, whether it be uh, Slavic languages or, or Romance languages, um, even, you know, we have resources that are available in Arabic and Chinese, and so if you haven't spent enough time on our website, please go there and you're going to find a lot of great open educational resource language learning content. Um, and again, not all of it's open, but a lot of it is. So uh, one project that you're going to hear a little bit more about in our third webinar is a new project that we've been working on called Spintex, and it's basically a video archive um, that you know, basically allows people to um, watch videos and le or basically learn how people are using uh, Spanish in, in, in Texas, but also uh, it's basically a, a way for others to sort of use this as a platform for potentially using it for other languages. Like, uh, again, you're going to hear a lot more about that as we talk about it with the project directors uh, and the project manager of that uh, coming up in a few weeks. All right, so. One other resource that is not associated with uh, the language resource centers, but is part of sort of an institutional um, uh, initiative, is that of the of Laurel, <laughs> kind of playing on that notion of a parrot in Spanish. But it's called Language Open Resources Online, 
And this is a fantastic resource uh, specific to language teaching and has an interface that much like uh, Language Box, as we described, has an interface for you to create an account, publish, and share your own resources. Uh, and most importantly, here you can actually connect with other language teachers throughout the globe, which is, again, part of this notion of communicating and collaborating with colleagues. Uh, one uh, other kind of really interesting project out uh, west in Washington, uh, Washington State, is that uh, is, a, is a, basically a project of images that are collected uh, as the culturally authentic pictorial lexicon. Um, and it's kind of like, in large part, the flicker for language professionals. Now, there's really great realia, um, and it kind of has other, way, uh, other ways of understanding how images uh, are, are sort of used in the context of, a, of certain, uh, uh, you know, sort of language situations. So uh, we invite you to check that out as well. Now, one of the more uh, convenient ways, I think, and sometimes about finding out where great resources are, are, are using social media. Um, two of the uh, hashtags that we'd recommend that you start with to sort of get familiar with what might be out there are uh, hashtag LangChat and another one called EdChat. Now, you're not going to find specific OER resources here, but from time to time they do come up. But it's also a great place to ask the question, hey, you know, what folks are, uh, you know, creating or using uh, OER in the context of, of language teaching or learning. Um, another community to begin to look at, I think, I mean, there are many more, but uh, some of those that we're kind of excited about are, are on Google Plus uh, in the Google community sort of uh, uh, part of it, and, and uh, one of which is the Foreign Language Teaching Group, uh, another one called Creating Open or Creating an Open Classroom, and another one called uh, Pure All Pure Hog. I can't even say it. Purology. There you go. In action. So check those out. I and mean, these are uh, again just the tip of the iceberg. And I think that's sometimes all you need to begin finding your own exploration into into finding resources. But having these conversations in these places, I think, is an important place to start. And um, but I can't stress enough sort of the importance of just talking to colleagues. Uh, those of you who are here today, I wish we could share the participants list so you could see one another, but we couldn't find a way to do that somehow. But uh, just talking to one another about what each are, are wanting and what do you want to create, uh, just the smallest amount of, of, of sort of inquiry into maybe what others are working on would lead you to, to a neat collaborative exercise. Uh, that can happen with your colleagues. It could happen with students. Uh, if many of you probably are in, in positions where you have such eager students who want to create projects. And what better way to sort of incent, you know, form a collaborative exercise than to say that this resource could be used by others and, and actually put into play and, 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 and become a learning resource that others can modify. Um, as we talked about, sort of uh, get on those online uh, groups and find out who, who else is doing some of this stuff. So. Wow, thanks, Garen. Um, that was a lot. <laughs> okay, I do see the, that there are many open resources available, um, but what are some of the difficulties people are likely to encounter while searching for materials? Yeah, so um, I think the first thing that, to really mention is that, like, that search isn't perfect. Like, every year it's getting better, but uh, there's not a guarantee in any one of these search engines or, or, or resources that we've pointed out here that you're going to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, and, but that's no excuse to simply wait around. I think and just wait for a publishing company or someone else to, to, to push something at you. Um, you know, there are going to be places where there's just not enough metadata that comes along with these resources to, 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 to in other words, allow people to find these resources easily. Different repositories use different APIs, so it's difficult to build uh, other applications and other things on top of it to make it easy to find. There's lots of broken links. There's old links. There's ones that have expired. Uh, content's old in some cases, right? Um, and as sort of we've been talking about throughout the presentation, or at least early on, some some folks had questions about like, is this an actual? Is this actually an open resource? Um, sometimes uh, resources that are created and shared seem like they should be open, but someone forgets to put a license on it. You see presentations where people license the, the presentation, but you, you, know, you see an image of uh, you know, uh, something that's a Coca-Cola commercial or a bear or who knows what, and 
it's difficult for you to understand how that can you know be licensed but that's no you know you're going to come up against these difficulties and there's questions but i think that it's important to realize that there are folks who you can ask about this and hopefully we can be a resource for folks who have questions uh, about about that so um Karen, um we did have some somebody asking what an api is and i actually wrote the answer already okay in the chat room but um, it, it, most of the time, it's a way to communicate to um, um, a library, um, a code library, to accomplish something. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know how to put it better. Yeah. So this is this is where it's handy to sort of uh, you know kind of look up online on, on Wikipedia, and there's going to be a great entry on APIs, uh, and, and then we can share it. Um, okay. Yeah. But if I find an open resource. Um, and I want to begin the process of creating one, or just have the desire to contextualize it to my classroom. Are there platforms for editing, remixing, and sharing? Yeah, so some of the resources that we talked about earlier, uh, like JISC and LanguageBox and, and, and uh, Loro, have built into their, uh, into their platforms an ability for folks to share resources. Uh, two others, or excuse me, I should say share and also contextualize and remix. Uh, two others I do want to highlight, though. Uh, one is an initiative by the Shuttleworth Foundation, which is a pretty great tool. Um, it's called OER Pub, and it's uh, basically it's an open source tool for authoring, um, adapting, remixing, and publishing content, and then again delivering these to to the web and to various devices. Right, so they're taking that a step further, realizing that as we talk about technology being in large part ubiquitous, or at least going mobile uh, for a lot of folks in the world, that that, that content should be available uh, on those devices, but also they still stress that reality of materials being in print. Uh, so allowing for folks to create content that can be easily downloaded and printed. Uh, Connections is another resource we talked about earlier, based at Rice University in Houston. Uh, we've got a new project called OpenStax College, which is about creating textbooks, uh, but at the same are open textbooks, but the Connections platform is 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 uh, one of the original sort of uh, uh, platforms for folks to begin uploading content and putting their uh, materials into what are called modules, uh, where you can organize courses and reports and books and other content, uh, and then you know largely um, uh, put those into into things that that you want for for your classroom or to collaborate with others. Um, What's neat about this is that there's a really large community that sits behind this and a lot of resources that go into developing. There's actually going to be, I think, a new version of this soon, so pay attention to that. Um, I won't have time to go into a lot of these, but you know, uh, there are a lot of other places. If you're doing videos, check out YouTube. There's a YouTube editor. Uh, OER Commons, as we mentioned earlier, has one. TED-Ed has a great place to, to sort of uh, explore remixing content. Uh, Open Tapestry is a sort of revo uh, renewed uh, Initiative out of uh, an organization in Utah uh, that is also quite doing something quite similar, where you can discover and, and adapt, and then share learning resources, and then organize your content into what's called an open tapestry. But I think what's important to realize here too is that standard Office Suite products and and things work just fine to remake content, and so do Google Docs, right? So just make sure to keep keep in mind the simple resources as well. As we near the end of the presentation, are there any final thoughts? Yeah, all right. So uh, I want to get back to, in large part, sort of uh, what we talked about earlier. And we hear a lot from teachers, right? And one of the things we often hear is, I'm looking for authentic learning materials and materials that will make my classroom more vibrant, my students, let's say, more engaged, or my lessons more contextualized and relevant to my students' learning experience. Uh, many of the folks who talk to us describe searches that they conduct online and the time they spend looking through publishers' offerings. Um, and and uh, they basically just describe that finding resources is difficult, right? And there's just so much out there, whether it be videos or music or photos or just different learning modules. Um, and, and that even when they do find something that might work, it's just sometimes a limited version or a trial version, uh, something that the teacher might have to purchase. Uh, or just can't adjust in a way that, that mo the, or modified to fit the context of the classroom, right? So that's what OER are addressing on, on one level, is, is this reality that, uh, you know, OER 
is about this community of practice, about people sharing, about people uh, giving people tools to, to sort of work to create content that makes sense for their situations, right? And I want to encourage people, I guess, to continually search out OER and the communities of practice around them. And as we go forward in search of OER, to begin to continually talk to people about what OER is, how others are using them in practice. Um, and then really, get, again, get back to that, con that understanding that learning uh, is not a linear pathway, but something that's quite organic. Um, I also want to stress that open educational resources aren't the solution, right? They're, they're a resource. They're, they're, they are a tool. They're a part of this transformation in learning. Um, and that there's, there, are, there are things that can be utilized to, to, again, help cultivate this environment of learning and growth uh, uh, and, and basically allow people to develop their own solutions um, and to, to contextualize or personalize these resources to their own learning contexts. Right? I think it's also just important to, to note then that everything starts with sharing. Um, and maybe we'll just end on this, is to say that tens of thousands of people every day are, are creating content and open content, right? There, there are organizations that have this as a part of their mission. There are people who dedicate their lives to basically repurposing and sharing materials. Um, I think it's just important to note that there are millions of resources at your fingertips for you to use and employ. I know it takes time to find it, but they're out there. Um, the ability for certain to for you to find these resources is 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 getting better. So if you're frustrated by not being able to find certain things, just keep talking and and maybe be a part of something that's improving that. Um, but know that as search gets better, we're going to be able to find materials that that, that uh, fit our context all that much better. Um, and I can't stress the importance enough of basically just trying out. And, and, and continually to encourage you to generate material. Uh, you know, use content creation tools that enable sharing when you're building projects or building lesson plans like Google Docs uh, so that you can easily share that material with someone else. Um, share, then basically when you're getting ready to share it, make sure you license it. Go to Creative Commons and, and find out how you can make use of, of their licenses and, and make their mater your material have an impact by uh, Right, and being very clear as to how other people can use it. Um, I would love to basically say to just keep on encouraging other colleagues and students that you have to share their material. And even if all you do is share links to open content or just promote the open community, that's, that's an important part of this. Um, and I think maybe something that's quite, quite, quite interesting is basically just support and comment on OER when you see it, right? Say thanks for sharing on a presentation or or, uh, or, or comment on, 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 on things on SlideShare or wherever it might be to say, hey, thanks for, thanks for doing this. Um, there's, there's no bad way to participate in this community, even if it's criticism or, or if it's, uh, or if it's uh, you know, complimentary. So um, I think what I'll finish up with though in saying is that uh, we haven't even, uh, well, I'll quote Kathy Casserly and say this by saying that like, which, and she's the CEO of Creative Commons. So what she says is that we haven't even come close to tapping the full potential of OER, and that we need to help more people understand that these materials are not just free. They can also create communities of teachers and learners who collaborate on their continuous improvement, and that that's the real magic, right, in the actual reuse and remix. So as you go forward in finding resources perhaps leave with this thought that it's also about you contextualizing those, rebuilding, and then sharing those back and helping build back into this community. So with that, I, I, I know that we're closing in on our hour. Um, I, I, I just wanted yeah. to mention again uh, for everybody who have the, uh, had the chance to see that in the chat room that uh, we'll have an upcoming webinar session next Wednesday, June the 19th, again at 3 p.m. Central Standard Time, and we will hear there about the practice of using and teaching with OER. That's right. And this, and and a lot of you have mentioned that would be of interest to you. So this will just be the natural next step in this discussion. That's right. Um, and so again, for those of you who have had a little bit of an issue with um, getting the CEUs or CMPs or CMEs or whatever we're calling them. Uh, We'll just um, 
we'll be in touch with you. That we'll, we'll go through this chat history here and, and find out uh, what uh, what we need to do to get you the the, the certificates. So. Thank you for attending, and uh, we'll see you all next time. So thank you very much. If there are any questions, uh, we'll, we can take them right now. Um, otherwise, we'll see you next week. Yeah, that's right. I also want to take the time to thank uh, Darren Pons for presenting. <laughs> and thank Natalie Chilton. For, for Steinville today for, for being the wonderful uh, the technical chat room host as well as the uh, the, the host of the session so